All right, so uh, this week, uh, Ozma was going to present chapter 10, and she made the slides, and then she is not able to actually present them. And so I told her I'd go ahead and try to do that. Um, I read the read this a couple days ago, and I've you know used it, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, I definitely welcome this being like more of a discussion than a uh, presentation because I don't know. We'll see how it goes. All right. So this week we're talking about chapter ten, which is about resampling for evaluating performance. Um, we're going to talk uh, about a lot of things. Um, we're going to talk about why you have to resample. That's why the kind of naive way that you might try to um, measure performance is can be bad. Um, we're going to use resampling to divide a training set into an analysis set and an assessment set in various ways. One thing that Ozma did point out to me uh, in chat that she wanted to call out is she went and was doing some reading about Monte Carlo cross-validation and um, really appreciated when she was reading outside of this book the terminology analysis set and assessment set because most sites just use like you divide divide your training set into a training set and a test set and then you also have your test set and she said it was like utterly confusing everything she was reading so analysis set is like the training training set and assessment set is the training test set and that's uh some vocabulary that we'll talk about um, then we'll use this, and once we were able to do it, we'll use it to estimate model performance. And we'll look at some um, functions from Tune to do that. We'll touch on how to use parallel processing with this and why um, why that makes sense. And we'll talk about how to save some of the objects out of the um, resampling. All right. So first, why? Um, as we talked about with chapter five, you know, uh, I kept like obsessively using that word inviolate, that uh, te the testing set should be inviolate, that you shouldn't touch it, shouldn't use it for anything other than at the very end to make sure your model works how you think it's going to work. But before you get there, like you'll have, you might have different models to compare to decide which one am I going to bother to test, or you might have... Um, which we'll talk about in a couple of chapters, have different tuning parameters that you need to evaluate. And so you need to do some sort of evaluation before you get to the test set. Um, and so that's what this is all about. How can you do that uh, when you just have the one training set? And the answer is basically, don't just have the one training set. All right, so um, they start out by uh, kind of doing a, what like what you might try to do where you're just um using the same training set looking at different models and then just taking that training set and putting it back into the model and seeing how good the model does which i mean that is part of what you want to do but uh there's a lot of example here <laughs> that all comes out to and i'm trying to find this there we go um we've got the lm fit has you know, 0.07 and uh, for RMSC and uh, an R squared of 0.8. The um, uh, random forest fit looks like it's like quite a bit better. Um, but then when you actually look at the test set, the random forest doesn't do nearly as well on the test set as it did in the training set. Um, that will happen a lot if you are not using resampling um, and they, they go into how uh, something like a, a linear model a linear regression or logistic regression is uh, what what they call high bias or what you know statisticians call high bias um, where uh, basically they are there they um, work pretty well at the or with with new data um, Versus low bias models, like a lot of black box new styles of models like random forests and deep learning and those kinds of things can be low bias if you're not careful, where uh, they're very tuned to a specific set of data, basically. Um, 
And so when you go to test them on the test set, which is different than your training set, they might fail spectacularly. Um, and so all of this was to say, yeah, this is something that's useful or something that needs to be figured out because you don't want to get to that test set, which again, you're only supposed to touch the one time and you get to it and go, oh, oh, my model sucks. Okay, uh, I guess I have to start over. Um, all right, so any questions at that point? Looks like we're good. All right. So then we get into resampling methods. The general idea, um, we, we've got a diagram here uh, looking at splitting up the general idea is you split up your training data into some sort of uh, resamples where you have an analyzed set and a, an evaluation set. And then again, your evaluation set is what you're gonna use to test your model your analyze set is what you're going to use to build the model. Um, and you make a whole bunch of these in different ways. And then you can use those to uh, choose different models or to tune the models or uh, otherwise find the best model. And then you take your best model that you're actually pretty confident actually is your best model. Use that to test. Um, let's see. And that's the that's the basics there. There are several kinds of um, of these methods for resampling. Uh, we're going to talk about cross validation. Um, we're going to talk. I, I thought this was a little weird that he made it or that they made it the second sub subsection. We're going to talk about validation sets where you're just making one split basically within the training set. Uh, we're going to talk about boot bootstrapping and we're going to call about or talk about rolling forecasting origin resampling and uh we're gonna talk about oh and then cross validation is split i was like and monte carlo is in there somewhere too um all right so these different methods of resampling let me jump back up here first okay yeah that's all good so cross validation um <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm I'm deciding how much how how teachery should I be when I'm not really prepared? Because that's what you do if you're a teacher when you're not you're prepared is you just call on people to explain things. Um, but no, I'll go ahead and I'll start at least that. So for our, our v fold cross validation is you uh, split your data into v folds. V can be um, technically v can be any number, any integer, positive integer. Um, I think they even talk about like a one fold is the basically the validation set. Um, but usually you want to do five or 10 fold. And the idea is you, you basically you're dividing everything up into groups. And then for group one, your analyze set is every group other than one. And your uh, 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 estimate set or your validation set is group one. And then for fold two, it's every group other than two. And then you use group two to actually analyze performance and so on. Um, and you know that, that way you get all these sets that are almost as big as your whole training set, but you have a little one left out that you use for testing, uh, for validating that your model makes sense or that your model is good. Um, and Ozma produced a whole bunch of examples here. Oh, and then the other one is you can do that. You can make those sets repeatedly um, to get even more, um, basically to, to, to get your Sigma smaller, to get it, uh, to hone in on um, a, a real estimate of the model performance. Can we talk about those those repetitions more? Because I, this is something I didn't really grasp when I when I did my first read through. Yes. Let me. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what my specific question would be. Is it that you take the same sp split and do it five times, or you have five different splits? Um, you would have five different splits. Would be my understanding of how that works. And so you do different random groupings. 
so that you get a, a more, you know, so that if there's one weirdo, it has, it's not always in the same set. Hmm. Um, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and, and then, it, you know, just the more you do it, there's, there's a limit with depending on how much data you have and time, I guess, is a lot of it too, because the more splitting you do, the more fitting you do. Um, <laughs> yeah. It feels nice like a little... t shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it lets you really be more confident about the fit before you go on to actually uh, testing it. So that sort of gets to a question I had, which I, I, I thought of this question multiple times as I read the chapter. It seems like this is all about sampling with replacement and without replacement, which is various types. Yeah. It's, it's, so, yeah. so where does adding that repeat does that cross over into with replacement? Because it seems um, like crossfold is without replacement, but then if you're repeating it, is it just shuffling which group it's assigned to? Or, does, so, or can the same weird point be there more than once across repeats? It could be there more than once across repeats, but it couldn't be there more than once within like a single fold. Um, mm, okay. whereas with bootstrapping, which I guess there's no real reason to go strictly in order, um, you know, with the bootstrapping, that same row can be there more than once because the idea is that each row, I mean, the way I always think of bootstrapping is, um, each row is representative. And so you take, you might use it more than once to represent another version of itself. Mm -hmm. And and so you're getting that distribution out of the original data set. And um, you know, there are cases where uh, using that bootstrapping, you actually get a better representation of the real data set, the, the you know, the the full data set than just your sample can possibly give. Right. Um, and so so that's you know uh, that is another technique that is down below that we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, but that's where it's actually with replacement um, within a single set. So, do you think this is pretty, I don't want to say linear, but there are some things like when tuning a model where you make a small change and suddenly you're fitting exponentially more models. It, if I, if I repeat things five times, I'm only taking the length and multiplying it by five, right? I'm not going to accidentally exponentially blow up. Yes, I, I, I was, I'm being really careful. I think, <laughs> I think that that, I mean, that's why they have the section on parallel processing yeah. towards the end is this is pretty, you know, all of these resampling techniques result in just multiplying out how many times you are doing the fit. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all independent of one another. And so that's uh, where we're going to get into parallel processing, where that is that is something that makes sense to make parallel, that they are all the same thing, just over, you know, repeated over and over. So in cross-validation, it's uh, V times R, right? Is what they yep. say? Yep. Not, not like V exported R. Right. V times R. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. In, ter in terms of, I mean, the whole point is to reduce noise in your performance metrics, right? Yes. How yeah. would it compare if you just did RV fold validation instead of R times V fold? So, you know. Oh, instead of, instead of doing, um, instead of doing 10 v and 5, times, just do 50? Yes. Uh that would result in very small data sets, right? Because you're, well, you're, you're testing, your um, test validation test data set would be tiny, tiny. Um, and so that's where the problem comes in, is you don't want your validation set to be so small that it's not really representative anymore. And, and back to your example about one weird outlier point, that would be in 
49 of the 50 <laughs> analysis, right. sorry analysis sets is that what it's called the, yes so it's um here let's yeah analysis, uh, an, sets. analysis and evaluation sets but if you did a v equals 10 with five repetitions your weird outlier point would only be in 45 of the 50 right because it would be yeah in the analysis sets yes and it would only be i, I think more importantly it would only be in uh our estimate estimation sets yeah and so when you're saying oh this model sucks because it can't predict this crazy thing mm -hmm. um but nothing, none of them really can create, predict that crazy thing. So let's wash that out. Let's let's divide that out um, across um, all of our samples, uh, all of our resamples. So, so is the suggestion that the more outliers, like the the more cases of like say a high Cook's distance, you expect, you should use more repeats. I'm not sure um it's yeah like i think it it seems more worth putting in the time if you're expecting more strangeness like um i don't have a good you know i don't have the the stats background to tell you how solidly that's like a rule um Me neither. yeah <laughs> And yeah, um, Tyler points out that that might be, I like, I would love to take it into the Slack to talk about, let's do a 50 fold versus five times 10 um, comparison and see uh, when it's different, when it matters. Um, and this is, this is yeah. all to improve our assessment of how the model did. It's not tuning the model. It's improving our understanding of how the model did. Yes. Right now, this is purely for, I mean, it's uh, improving our assessment of how the model did and therefore improving which model we use. Um, right. But it's not changing the coefficients. It's not boosting the R squared or anything like that. Right. But yeah, we're using this so that uh, the estimate we have of performance, um, which we'll come to in a minute, is more re you know more likely to match what testing shows us. Curious, curiously, I, I didn't see underfitting or overfitting anywhere in the in the chapter. They they always go back to low bias or high bias, but that's uh, mm -hmm. twelve chapter no, twelve. We talk about overfitting and underfitting. Apparently, um, yeah, like, I mean, that is um, definitely the danger. Like, that's the main thing I've always thought of a validation set as being for is um, you stop your model from, <laughs> I don't know, like from from thinking that it's doing too, too good because it's got this other data set that it's not training on that... Um, stop you from thinking that your training or your model is doing too well, whatever, so that you've got this other thing over here to, to put it in its place that when it tries that, it's like, Oh, Nope. Whoops. I was overfit. I, that I have no idea what to do with this validation set over here. So. Don't you also tune your hyperparameters on your uh, resampling sets though? Yeah. So yeah, we're going to get into a lot more uses for this stuff in chapter 12. And I actually, I, I wish I had had a chance to read chapter 11 because it's not clear to me yet what the difference is between these chapters other than it would have been a super long chapter if 10 and 11 were all in one chapter. Um, because we talk about estimating performance and we're talking about we're doing this in order to be able to better choose the correct model. And then chapter 11 is comparing models with resampling, which I think is more of how to do this. Um, I don't know if anyone else has looked ahead to see 
But I, I think basically he, we're getting the, the foundation here of how the resampling works and how you can actually do the estimating and the fitting and everything. And then in 11, we're going to actually choose models. And then in 12, we're going to, okay, not just choose between different types of models, but choose within a model different parameters. So actually, I think I just figured it out. I think that's <laughs> that is the split. Does that make sense? All right. Um, so I actually, I don't remember um, what Monte Carlo is in this context. Let me see. Does anyone have a good explanation that they can pull out of their, their tool belt? <laughs> oh, right. So you're making, you're taking, you know, like 90% of the data across 20 different samples. So each one of the samples has 90% of the data in it. Um, it's kind of like the crossfold, except it's not, uh, it's not it's it's not uh strict <laughs> like it's here's a random 90% random 90% random 90% so is that so, right? so so this is with replacement um again uh, between samples yes but not within a single sample okay that that's something okay that they made that's not a distinction, a distinction i was drawing okay yeah so bootstrapping within a single sample, you can have the same row multiple times. Uh, cross validation, each row is only in one of the sets, and then you use those sets to build each of the um, analysis sets. Monte Carlo, each row has a 90% chance of being in the uh, analysis um, and a 10% chance of being in the um, uh, uh, the other one, Valid it's not validation, evaluation. Um, all right, so yeah, does that make sense? I don't know, like, it's not, I guess, I guess an advantage with Monte Carlo is it's getting towards bootstrapping where you don't use up as much of, although whatever, 10% is in the validation either way if you're doing 10 crossfold. Does anyone have a reason? I don't remember if he talks about a reason or they talk about a reason for Monte Carlo. Um, it just seems like a fuzzier version of CV to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so he, he actually doesn't talk about it very much. So um, I think that's why uh, Ozma went out and just read a bunch of stuff trying to learn about it. And it's unfortunate that she <laughs> couldn't be here to walk through what she found. I wonder if like, like in the Bayesian world, if, if you've got less data to begin with, it's a way to uh, mix things up between yeah. uh, 20. I could see that. Like, um, it could be something like what we're going to look at in the later chapters where, um, you know, doing like a grid search versus a random search through parameter space. Uh, a lot of times a random search can actually do a better job of covering the whole space than some, you know, a, a cross validation set is more like a grid search. I'm going to make these the exact data sets that are possible. I mean, there are many versions of them possible, but I'm using everything, you know, I'm using exactly one tenth in each validation set and that validation set is different from every other validation set, yada, yada, yada. Um, so I could see where you get some, <laughs> like, you know, some of that statistical magic by doing a Monte Carlo cross validation, maybe. Um, I don't know. And if anyone knows any more, I would, uh, I'd love to hear more. Um, all right. So next we, we get into the validation sets. Um, and uh, 
this is just where you basically take your training set and split it into training and validation. Um, it is weird to me that they put this this deep into uh, this section because it seems like the simplest way you could possibly make um, analysis and estimation sets would be this, where you just take off, you know, it's basically a one fold cross validation. You've got one validation set that you split off and then everything else is your training set. Um, pretty straightforward. Again, it seems weird to me. Like, okay, it, like he, he does talk about, or they talk about that if you just got a ton of data, like who, why do anything fancy? Like just take your validation set and split it off and you got your training set over here. But I don't know, like I, I still, I think having the, the cross sampling or cross validation can help even then help your weird outliers be weird. <laughs> I mean, you know, if your weird outlier happens to be in training or happens to be in validation versus it's in both, um, it seems like that's useful. Uh, so yeah, that's the, the validation. I talked a little bit about bootstrapping and, um, you know, I like the, the graphics that they use where, you know, row one is in here twice. And that's, that's basically what's going on with bootstrapping is you're taking a sample of your data um, where each piece of each row represents a set of rows is the way I always think of this kind of thing. And so you might have, uh, you know, row one uh, shows up twice because that's, that's two of the, you know, people or things or whatever that it's representing. And, you know, row 13 is representing three people in this happen, this random set. And then another random set, it's basically taking a different sample out of that that uh, set. And this is different than using like something like, like expand grid to simulate wholly new data that didn't exist. Right. right. It's, it's, yeah, it's still taking that row that does exist and saying, you know, let's assume that there could be a clone of that row. Now, in a lot of cases, there can't be an exact clone. Um, and that might be kind of a sign that bootstrapping doesn't make sense here if if there are things that are really, really unique about your samples. Um, <laughs> but, but if they're that unique, then the features aren't going to be useful for training anyway. So um, it's still, it can be uh, really useful still. Um, I think that's, and, and it's really simple to make the bootstrap samples because you know, you're just telling it how, how many times do you want to do a pull and how, you know, how many sets do you want to make? Um, it's going to use all your data and, and figure that out. Um, and I think, I think, he, oops, I think in the chapter that they talk about that, um, there's just like a set and yes, it is with replacement Pavitra. Um, yeah, in or in Pavitra, in our sample, they do a uh, 63.2% chance of inclusion in training set, 36.8 in um, the, the test set uh, or assessment set. Um, he, they throw out those numbers and I don't, I don't know if there's a reason for that. Um, Or if that was just an example, and I'm reading too much into it, um, this should be our sample. Um, yeah, I'm trying to see if there's anything. So I don't know if those numbers stand out to anyone, because it's not uh, like even or normal breakpoints. Sixty-three point two percent and thirty-six point eight percent. Um, but I assume that again, that's, oh, that's gotta be, that's gotta be a normal distribution, something, something cut off, right? That Might looks like everything within, so, no. what, what, everything within one standard deviation. Yeah. No, yeah. Two, two standard deviations. Or yeah. One, two, yeah. Um, no, it's, it's not two standard deviations is 
that's something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not one standard deviation either. I think it's like 67%. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I know I, those numbers don't sound right. I agree. Okay. Yeah. Um, it has, it's something. <laughs> it is something distribution related. Um, but I don't know why it's those numbers. And again, maybe I'm misunderstanding it. This is one of those where, um, yeah. <laughs> when I learned about it, my professor just kind of said, like, when you just do it multiple, like, when you just keep doing it, it'll, like, that's just how it'll play out. Um, and I, I just took it at face value. So. Yeah, this is one where I hadn't really thought about it. Well, I did think of it when I was reading the chapter, but I wasn't going to present it, so I didn't uh, dig into it. That I'm tempted to go through and just um, F2 through the code. I don't know if you know this, but if you're in RStudio and you hover over a function, you hit F2, it goes to the definition of that function. And so, uh, you know, these functions have internal functions that have in, that call internal functions that call internal functions. And so a lot of times I will just um, fork the repo and F2 through the code until I understand what the heck's going on. Um, Cause here, I don't know, like looking at it, I couldn't tell you exactly what it does. Just pulling up the code for uh, bootstrap. And yeah, you can just double or double click in some places. Or control, yeah, it's not double click because double click is select. But yeah, F2 and F1 loads the help menu for that function while we're at it with those, like my two favorite hotkeys. Um, anyway, so that's bootstrapping. It, it It's a little bit, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I'm a little vague on exactly how it works, but the general idea is you're taking a sample out of your sample. Um, and you, something that is nice about this is it works pretty well for, I mean, it works as well as it can work for uh, small sample sets. Um, it, it helps you make use of small sample size, basically. All right. <laughs> And then uh, rolling forecasting origin resampling. Um, I don't do anything with time series. I have never touched this. And so again, this is one that I kind of skimmed through when I was reading the chapter. Uh, if anyone, before I just quickly reread, can explain how this works, that would be awesome. It's really recent. I thought that was interesting. Um, yeah, Tyler should should help us through this one. Well, this is Rob Hyman's stuff, right? Yeah, like, and a lot of it, like, and he's been introducing new methods over oh, the last couple of years. It's something. It's where you're doing like it's kind of a time based cross validation. Is that kind of right? Where your samples um, make sure that you have uh, like. Uh, you know, you take everything up to a point, and then this this one here is in your um, estimate, your your uh, yeah, your estimate set, and then uh, you, you kind of roll what gets into your estimate set versus yeah. Where so starting. here, based on on the graph here, it is yeah. with it is with replacement, right? Because looking down, like two is there a couple of times, three is there a couple of times. It's in the original so, data set too. So it's, though, more, so. it's more about uh, the order of the. It's like an order sensitive. I think CD there's a typo thing. here in this graphic. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. 133 three is supposed to be 123. That threw me off for a second there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so resample one is supposed to be 1234567 in the um, analysis set not one, three, three. So it's not with replacement. And it's just that you're rolling where you start and then taking the stuff after that as your um, estimate set. Right. This, this is pretty cool. So uh, 
Tan and I work with with NFL data sometimes. So I'm thinking about okay, fit your model on you know the year 2000 through 2015, and then estimate the performance in 2016, 17, 18, and then do 2001 through 2016, and then you know 17, 18, 19. Something like that, because there there are you know if you if you follow the NFL, they're getting more pass heavy or there are different rule changes and things like that. And so this is I, I haven't seen this before either, but just kind of based on the picture, this is this is pretty cool. I've seen uh, maybe I, it wasn't framed like this explicitly, but I've seen this done in hockey analysis as well, hmm. where they'll train a model like expect a goal model on the first four years after the 05 or 06 lockout and then test on, you know, the last, the, the two after that. Well, and the, I guess the one caveat that I would bring in that, you know, if anything that you're doing time data on, uh, the, the nice thing that this is going to do is put the year 2020 only in some of your sets mm -hmm. um, because the year 2020 is broken and wrong year yeah. 2021 okay. is probably also broken and wrong um and so when you use that for modeling it makes everything crazy and so the idea is that it's only going to be in some of your estimate sets and only going to be in some of your model fit sets if you did it by year for example um, a pretty big advantage to like if you just stratify it on year you could easily fit all of your data on whatever through 2019 and have 2020 in all of your estimate sets which, you know, like to all the reasons John just said would be bad. <laughs> right. I mean, especially, you know, you have March 2020 when everything just goes insane. Um, so, yes, I, I think it is for making sure you have that this rolling difference. And then they they talk, or he, um, yeah, they talk about where you've got kind of this happening multiple times within your time data. So you, you do... Um, like a 30 day block and then you skip and then you do a 30 day block and then you skip. Um, so, all right. So, um, so, so just real quick, Joe, I think you had an interesting point about how this relates to stratification. I don't know if, if you could expand on that. Uh, uh, I'll be, I'll be <laughs> winging it. That's for sure. I, I was thinking about like the, like a, a V, fold right you can pick five cross folds and stratify on year and that would put each of the years in kind of equal proportion um as opposed to having all of the data for those years in in whatever however many resamples until that year is cut off is that Am I on the right track? I guess if you stratified, you would only have 80% of, of 2008, for example, in one resample. Right. But if you did this rolling forecast, you would have 20, 2008 in there up until the point where you, you lose it and you roll into the next year. Yeah. Anyway, so. But um, isn't, isn't stratification defined in, in the recipe? So you could do both. Unless I'm wrong. Well, the so part of the idea is, you know, you're going to do it within your training set. You're doing a different stratification, basically. Um, because you've got your test set. You know, like your test set might just be the most recent data. Um, but you want to do something in the training to kind of simulate, okay, okay. how is this going to yeah, do yeah. on something like a test set? Um, but you still want to be able to have multiple resamples. And so you don't want to just take the end of it is the um, evaluation set and the beginnings, the analysis set, because then they're all the same. All right. All right. So now we get into how to, you know, how to use this. Um, and this is kind of the beginning of what Tune uh, is for and can do. Um, I think, oh, okay. Uh, let me pull up something real quick. 
Um, oh, interesting. So <laughs> if we go back, so, oh, not there. Um, so apparently this doesn't match with uh, Hinman's notes, so. So, I mean, if you, if you go through the forecast in the book, the the origin refers to the point that you're doing the forecast, not that the time series starts. It's like you're always training on you know your full time span up to the origin, which is where you start making forecasts. So oh. like in the first, so it should example, be, it should be like one two three four five seven eight one two three four five six seven eight nine one two three four five six seven eight nine ten. I think he talks about. Or, or they talk about that it can include those earlier ones, but I think it doesn't have to. Yeah, I think there's an argument. Yeah, it's a cumulative thing. Argument down below, I think. Yeah. yeah. So they must just be using a, the rolling origin name as a grander concept of the... That's pr it, it, I wonder if they mean uh, like, it's like days since you know the origin. Instead of the true like day one and then day two and then day three. Anyway, so that's um, that's a a way to resample with time, um, and it's interesting. Um, and I might I actually might have a use for something kind of like this. So we'll see. All right. Um, so estimating performance, um, we are looking at the. This is getting into the tune package, um, which is mostly what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the book that is written so far, I think, is mostly the tune package. Um, and this is going to let us uh, fit to the resamples using, or fit using the resamples, um, and then compute a bunch of performance metrics. Um, <laughs> it's funny because clearly uh, Ozma kind of ran out of steam here because this is part of or she covered part of this chapter but the general idea is that we can fit to all of our resamples really easily like fit resamples is basically just fit um, with a couple of other arguments and instead of giving it your data you give it these the folds which are the data basically. Um, and that will let you, uh, you know, you can start from workflow, you can start from a model specification, you can give it a formula or recipe or whatever, just like, just like fitting in tiny models, you can fit resamples from all the different starting points. Uh, you sometimes want to give it some control. So that's what that control argument is about. Um, and that lets you just do this this fit across all of your samples. And then once you have that fit, you can uh, collect metrics and that lets you see, okay, how did it do? So collect metrics on that um, that sample or that resample rather, the, the, all of those models. Um, I'm trying to remember where, uh, where we told it what fits. Oh, it's gonna use certain metrics by default unless we specify the metrics. Um, and so, yeah, we can specify which metric sets, you know, which metrics we're gonna collect. Um, and, and then you can do that, collect metrics and see how, how it did across the folds. Um, <laughs> uh, Pavitra asked about um, dynamically tuning hyperparameters and I'm just gonna say, you know, put a pin on in that because that is, uh, starting at chapter 12, that's the rest of the book. Um, at least that it, the rest of the book that has been written so far. But we're not quite there into tuning the hyperparameters yet. Um, but yeah, so what, what they're showing us here is just that we can, like, we can do all this fitting and then we can collect the metrics and we can um, collect the predictions if we want to dig into what is going wrong exactly. Oh, and I've got an echo, so if you're not muted, watch for that. Okay, no more echo right now. Um, you can use that to try to find, you know, what what is failing? Is there something about the thing that is failing? Um, 
because there is some manual work still within modeling a lot of times of, oh, I didn't account, you know, I didn't extract features very well because there's this one case <laughs> that ends up having a location of NA or something. Um, so we can we can do that with our fit object and then we can, uh, we can remember what else that I wanted to point. Oh, um, no, that's it. So fit resamples, collect metrics and collect predictions is basically what we talk about here. And again, in this chapter, we're talking about like, how do we get this data? Chapter 11, we're gonna dive deep into, okay, and then what? What do we do with this data now that we have it? And how do we use that to de determine which model makes more sense? Um, I, I agree, Tyler. So Tyler brought up going back to um, this. We've got cumul cumulative equals true here, but this graphic is cumulative equals false because there should be, it should always start at one if it's cumulative equals true. Um, and then it would just be that resample two is longer than resample one, resample three is longer than resample two, et cetera. Does that make sense? Or do you agree, Tyler? Yeah, so, I was just yeah. I was just I was just looking into it because <laughs> I, I thought that graph I thought that graphic came from the book, but it only partially did. I mean it comes from the tidy models book, but not the uh Hinman book, right? I'm looking at the tidy models book. I don't see the, the code beneath it. I see the graphic. Oh, oh right, right, yeah, yeah. Um the code is a cleaner example from uh, a different point. Um, actually, I think this was just her her sample, but yes, that okay. that code does not go with that graphic. Yeah. Um, okay. He doesn't give code that's exactly that graphic, actually. Um, nope. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, so yeah, so uh, this section 10.3, the basic idea is that we've got our three functions from tune fit resamples to actually do the fit, collect metrics to get the, um, the metric set out of all of those fits, and then collect predictions to look at specific predictions out of those sets. Um, and then we're gonna look into exact, you know, more about, I mean, they gave examples of some things we can do with that once we have it, um, but there will be even more that we can do with it in a little bit. And then um, I'm going to just basically mention he talks about or they talk about parallel processing that this is something when you're doing resampling, you are making, you know, like 10 or 50 of the same problem. So that is, uh, you know, uh, they use the phrase embarrassingly parallel, like it is l the same problem 50 times. So run it across 50 processors if you can. Um, they warn that each time you do that, um, like each processor needs to get the whole data set or at least, well, yeah, it ends up getting the whole data set. And so it can explode your RAM if you do too many of these, so watch out for that. But otherwise, um, going parallel makes sense when you're doing resample fitting. It's pretty much all the parallel processing section is about. And then uh, I think 10.5, which is uh, 10.6 in our notes, the saving the resampled objects is a reference section in my mind. It's okay, but what if I want the stuff that's in there that you normally would just throw away? Um, here's instructions for how to pull it out. But in a lot of cases, you don't care about it. And that's why it gets thrown away by default. So um, I'm not really gonna go into 10.6 because it's, uh, or sorry, into saving the resampled objects. It's special so, cases. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, I've, I guess not specifically with that, but sometimes you can kind of use that to get some idea of, variance of like model coefficients right because you have all the if you, if you just if you're just taking the performance and you're throwing away the actual well uh, um 
yeah, you are throwing away the actual like actual model at that point. And the idea is that once you um kind of once you have it figured out what you're gonna do, use the whole data set to actually train your model. Yeah, and, and you would do that, but you'd still want to know, you know, how confident am I like how, how much variability could there have been in a certain coefficient? Which That's you know, right. you might look at p value or something like that. But another way is well if you're doing this kind of repeated resampling, like you have uh, a distribution of parameters. That's true. Um, uh, I th I've done something similar to that. I don't know if it, if it was a good idea or not, <laughs> but I've definitely saved the predictions and done some some of my histograms and things on, on like if it's binary classification, I'll, I'll take that and look at the That's mean fair. prediction for an observation for the you know the, the first uh for like the positive like the one or the zero right that makes sense and, you know in any kind of model that does automatic feature selection then yeah. you know sometimes especially once it gets down to the more uh you know the point where <laughs> these are on the edge of being a uh, signal um, you know, if you find out that a feature is only coming through like one out of the 10 folds, then it's like, well, is that something I want to necessarily keep if it does make it through in the end or? That's a good point, especially, um, yeah, like, you know, if you've got some, something that is going to be overcomplicated in the final model, you might use these to kind of judge, oh, this thing I'm doing all this work and it doesn't really gain anything. You know, it it's only actually used, like you say, in like one out of the 10 models, something like that. So yeah, there are reasons to look at it. Um, so it, it's interesting to me that um, these examples in here, like, you know, uh, we've got things like this that I'm gonna paste in the chat. Um, It says to me that they're not done. Like, if you've got to use that to get a result out, then uh, that is, you know, not falling into that intuitive uh, zone that they want you to, want things to be in when you're using tidy models. Um, so I feel like part of why this feels like a, an off a weird section to me is that it's so it doesn't look like tidy models the code that yeah I, th I think some of those examples in the last part of the chapter are outside of like the happy path yeah as soon as you start getting into like brackets within brackets one <laughs> and then you the you other know, there, there's another one where you have to do a map um to extract all the bracket one bracket ones and uh like that you can tell that you're you're off the beaten path at that point again there are times when it totally makes sense and when it does when you want to look at something in those model objects remember that this section exists and go uh read about how to get that thing that you want to get out um but it's it seems really uh off the beaten path right now to me um it seems like it seems like if, if they're gonna if that was gonna be a common thing then then they'd write a function to do that right so I don't know um I don't, I, I do feel like I've definitely done some things over in like and we quickly had stories of doing things over in here so it's it might not be that it's so weird it's just that it's not done yet it doesn't feel done to me um tidy models is constantly expanding so maybe by the time the book is actually finished these things won't have such weird and again it's just simple base r like tyler says you know it's not it's not super weird but it's not um the happy path it there isn't a function specifically to extract that piece out um and so that seems a little off all right, so that's the chapter. 
Um, I hope that wasn't too too bad. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions that we didn't get to? And more importantly, while we're thinking about any questions that people didn't get to, is who wants to do chapter 11, comparing models with resampling? Anyone? Anyone? I'm actually not going to beg super hard for this one because I actually have some time this week. So maybe, maybe I actually will do another chapter. Let's see. Ooh. It's got some pretty stuff in here. So yeah, okay, I'll do chapter 11 unless someone else wants to. Uh, I do highly recommend presenting a chapter if you, if you can and if you haven't done so yet. Um, so feel free to speak up in the chat and say, oh, okay, I wanna do that one. Um, but if not, I'll do it. No problem. Um, and be thinking we only have, uh, four chapters left, including that one. Um, there are probably going to be about five chapters after what's written. Maybe some of those will happen before we're done. Um, but most likely they won't. And so that will be interesting to see, um, we're going to get to a point where we run out of book basically. So we should also start thinking about what do we want to do? Do we want to pause the club? Do we want to go do like the feature engineering book? Um, just start thinking about that. Um, but I am going to pause at, or give everyone a second. If anyone has any other questions that we want to, or anything else that we want to talk about. I had, I had one question if, if I mean, you don't have to stick around if, if, if you're at time, but uh, I was thinking about something Tyler said, how maybe we, in, in your resamples, you have in, in a feature selection, you have one feature that's coming through and just one model. And this kind of gets into something that I struggle with for machine learning, where do I want to manually go in and take that out myself? Or is there something that is there something that we talked about today that could let us do that automatically. So if if we use the repeat function five times on a on a ten cross fold validation, will the machine learn? Will the tools that are built in place handle that one weird predictor that's coming through? So what I would like, if it doesn't cost you anything to include it, as far as you don't have to do any spe special processing to get that feature, meh, whatever. It's not that big of a deal to include it. You're wasting some RAM. You're probably wasting some time, but it's not that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. But if that is a feature you are, uh, you know, artisanally crafting out of your data and it's really difficult or it adds, I mean, it's at all difficult if it does, mm -hmm. if it takes anything to get that feature out, um, getting that out of the model doesn't matter for right now while you're training the model, but it matter, matters when you're using the model down the road that you have to keep doing this processing to get this one feature that, oh, by the way, it doesn't matter anyway. Like cut that, cut out the, uh, the cycles. Um, <laughs> yeah. And yes, your organic non-GMO models with your artisanal features. Um, I mean, you know, I have some where uh, I do some, some text processing and you know, I'm doing like using BERT to create features out of text. Mm -hmm. And if those features aren't being used, that's a lot of work and a lot of RAM and just a lot of bad things if they're not being used. If all I needed to know was like how many verbs are there in the sentence or something. Um, so that would be the cases where you want to find out, oh God, like, yes, technically this one's going to come up as being used in the final model. Barely, like it's not really important. You can learn this without this um, thing. Or even like for something like that, if it's a really intensive thing, if one out of the 10 doesn't use those features, I might go, huh, let's try training. Let, let's try not using those features at all then. <laughs> Cause one out of the 10 was able to be successful without it, you know? Um, so that's where I would use that kind of thing. And maybe, like, it depends on, like, how, how on the edge of, you know, I need this result in 
a, a billionth of a second. And so any extra processing that's happening on my training or on my actual, you know, later data is going to be high cost. Then you might want to get rid of whatever you can get rid of. Um, so that's yeah, where I would that, put that. That would be, I mean, I don't know if that exists, but I, I definitely could see the utility in that. And once you've gone through the training process, I mean, I might start off with my data set that has hundreds of columns and I end up only using 15. You know, right. I don't need to bring in all that data to, to go through the workflow. Maybe your, maybe workflows already handles that. Uh, but I would want it. I, I would hope that in the finalized workflow, it would only be pulling in the data that it needs to do the full job. Is, is that true? I'm not 100% certain. Um, and so that might be something where you have to kind of manually tune things at the end. And I I suspect this is getting into those packages that don't exist yet around deployment. Because deployment is where you care of, get rid of that. I don't want that column. That column doesn't do anything. Drop that at the very beginning if I'm not going to use it. Um, and so that, but yeah, all of this, kind of works around that. Like I hadn't, until I said it, I hadn't even really thought about the, huh, if I've got one model that doesn't use that complex feature and it works, uh, I want to know about that <laughs> so that I can get rid of that complex feature and maybe try again. And maybe I, you know, maybe all 10 models will work almost as well without that complex feature. Um, yeah, is there any, and this is totally off, top, off the, <laughs> off the, 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 the chapter now, but is, is there any package, maybe I missed it, like measuring the drop in performance if you drop a, a, a predictor? Like I know that that's sort of what <laughs> happens in, in random forest with, with, with right. real world wardens. It's, I, I think there is. I, um, I couldn't tell you what, but I think there is something in tidy models for that, but it's very, that is very model specific. Like some models <laughs> deal with that. Oh, I could have sworn though that there was something that is specifically for um, feature importance. And maybe this is where we have to go read the other book on feature engineering. And I, I think, yeah, I, I've, I've just finished the feature engineering book and there's a, a lot there. It's less, um, of course it was written before, um, a lot of these tools were, but, but yeah, those methods are, he, he goes through that in a lot of detail. All right. So, um, but yeah, there's an auto plot method on resamples too, that, that you can um, you, uh, dump it into auto plot and, and um, there's some, some other graphical goodies in, in the, uh, in the tidy models website that didn't make the book we're reading. Yeah. Looking in the, uh, this is one of the issues for tidy models. It said that they use the VIP package for feature importance. Oh, okay. I'll put a link to it. Yeah, I've used I've used that a lot, but I was more thinking of like. What's your gain in like R squared or, or RMSE mm. if, based on if you include or exclude a certain variable? Yeah. Thanks, John. Yeah, thank you. Um, that was that was interesting for sure. <laughs> All right. See everyone next week. Next week. Thanks.